So welcome. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our seminar speaker, uh, Mr. Claudia Codesso. Uh, Claudia is an associate researcher at Fiocruz, which is a public um, health research institution in Brazil. She develops research in epidemiology of transmissible diseases, mainly climate sensitive diseases such as vector borne respiratory and waterborne diseases. She has experience in mathematical modeling and design of field studies, as well as developing analytical methods for disease surveillance. She has a long experience as a consultant to the Brazilian Ministry of Health, and she teaches epidemiological modeling at the Epidemiology and Public Health Graduate Program at Fiocruz, and she has been visiting us here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in the Global Health Resilience Team and we look forward to building strong collaborations with Claudia and her team through uh, some new projects we have starting um, this year. So thank you, Claudia. Please uh, feel free to go ahead. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for your kind introduction. And I'm really delighted to be here. And I, uh, I'm going to present some of the work that I've been doing. And I hope uh, you guys, you all will like it and have this uh, a fruitful discussion later on. Okay, so uh, I'm going to present a, a project that uh, we've been developing for the last uh, six to seven years is the Info Dengue. Uh, but uh, I'm going to present this project, but at the same time, during the process of this uh, introducing this uh, platform, I'm going to discuss uh, some problems, some uh, challenges regarding the uh, transmission of uh, climate sensitive diseases, especially dengue fever, which is a major problem in tropical areas. So, um, okay, one moment. Okay, that is how I move this now. You can hold that. Okay, sorry. Okay, so first of all, this is the info uh, introducing it. It's a, a system, a platform that we developed for Brazil. And uh, um, this platform uh, is used for the country, for the municipalities and the state and the federal uh, government, the government to uh, monitor the situation of dengue in Brazil. And uh, it's a system that uh, has a, a, an API for, for people to uh, analyze the data if someone wants to, to um, download the data and analyze the data is uh, there. And also uh, has a, a set of indicators that are useful for tracking the dynamics of the disease. So this is the, the general project, the general product. And uh, I'm gonna, talk today is about the history behind this. Okay, so um, this can be, this is in the internet, so anyone that is curious about it can go there. It uh, can be, uh, has an English version and a version in Castellano and uh, a version in Portuguese. And anyone can type like a, a city or some uh, place in Brazil and see all the statistics regarding that place and all the, the conditions of transmission of that disease in, in this uh, city. And these include not only dengue, but also other uh, vector-borne diseases like chikungunya and Zika. So uh, this is uh, always uh, going to ever be a, a work in progress. It is, uh, it's a research project, and uh, it's uh, in the GitHub platform. So anyone that can want to join and <laughs> collaborate and in any way, or you uh, learn with this, get the code and develop other things, it's available there. It's an open source platform. So, okay. Um, we are, the, the, the team behind this InfoDengue system is a, a team of researchers from two institutions in Brazil. Uh, Fiocruz, this is the, this castle, the castle there. Let's see if I can show up ah, that castle. I think that's the only castle in Brazil. <laughs> and it's surrounded by this uh, forest, very nice area, just like here with these beautiful gardens around. 
but also we are surrounded by uh, favelas, these slums, uh, people living in a very uh, difficult situations and where uh, dengue and the vector-borne diseases uh, are uh, abundant. And at the same time, the same city, this is Rio de Janeiro, and the other, we have the other, uh, our partner, that's the other institution, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, where the School of Applied Math is uh, located. And this is in the, the more touristic area of Rio. So I show these two pictures here to uh, show the contrast and the challenges that we face when uh, monitoring and understanding the dynamics of a disease that has such uh, important uh, social and uh, environmental determinants. So it's a really a big challenge. And I'm just showing the Rio de Janeiro, but I think in the scale of the whole country with all this di diverse environment and diverse social conditions, it's really a challenge to develop a system or any uh, way to track the conditions in a way that can be scaled up and down according to the situation. So that was the, the, the challenge that we had. Okay, um, it's important to say that uh, dengue is not uh, like a very old disease for us, for the, the especially for South and Central America. Uh, actually, the disease has emerged uh, somewhat recently in the last decades. And this is uh, to show that uh, the mosquito Aedes aegypti is the, the mosquito that transmits these diseases. Uh, it was actually absent in the whole South Africa in the 1970. So, and this is, there's a whole history behind this. I don't want to have have time to, to tell about it. But uh, in the past, we had in a short, uh, in short, uh, in the past, we had this uh, period where the mosquito was very abundant and was responsible for the transmission of other diseases. And then there was a big um, effort to eliminate these mosquitoes. It was actually eliminated from most of the, the continent. And then it returned again. So in 2010, we already have the mosquitoes like uh, everywhere. And we know now that the mosquito keep uh, expanding this species. It's a very uh, adaptive species. And uh, we already see this uh, very close to Europe. And the Madeira Island is already colonized. And we see this pattern uh, of colonization and geographical expansion of this disease. And uh, in 2000, and, uh, about 2000, when I started working with the dengue uh, epidemiology, the disease, uh, despite the fact that the mosquito was like well distributed, the disease was still uh, concentrated in some spots or only. Okay, so it was still uh, not uh, so well distributed disease, but it was already causing large outbreaks. So if you see, if we go back to 2000 case, okay, we see that uh, it was like uh, only uh, 15 years since the introduction of the virus. So actually uh, it's important to say that dengue is transmitted. No, dengue is caused by four viruses. Okay, you have dengue one, two, three, and four. Dengue one arrived in 80, uh, 1985, dengue two in 1990, but it was only when dengue three arrived in about 2000 that the big epidemics start to happen. So you have all these multiple viruses circulating and the number of uh, um, severe uh, cases is starting to increase. So at this time, uh, dengue was somewhat recent and uh, becoming more and more severe in a public health problem as a, in a public health uh, uh, emergency. Okay? And that led to the community of researchers that uh, were working in other teams to uh, drop their original projects and start working on dengue. Okay? So in Brazil and in most of the world, during this period, there was a big shift of the community to study dengue fever and all the factors around it. And uh, back then we were modelers and uh, we were 
uh, asked about these questions that are not very different that to the questions that we pose to COVID now. So what's the risk of introduction of a new virus? What's the risk of urbanization of a, a sylvetic virus? What's the probability of a large epidemic next year of a new wave? What are the areas at highest risk? So all these questions, they, they were posed back then for dengue, and they are uh, still uh, open questions. So we keep asking these questions to, uh, for other places or for other diseases. Okay, so these are fundamental questions in uh, epidemiology. And uh, back then, in the beginning of this, uh, we didn't know much about uh, dengue, the, the, the dynamics of dengue, and uh, didn't know much about the biology of the mosquitoes. So it was very hard to uh, come up with predictive models. So uh, in the beginning, we had to do uh, what we could with models without data. So we had these uh, publications uh, uh, discussing all the uncertainties regarding the, the modeling of these diseases. We could do like risk assessments, but it was very hard to really uh, uh, come up with precise estimates. But uh, this is the beginning of any new problem. And uh, this called the attention of uh, the, the community, of the entomological community and the biologists. And we end up actually uh, spending a long time really working together with uh, uh, field researchers, uh, trying to gain knowledge about the dynamics, all the biology and entomology and the transmission of these diseases of dengue and these diseases in, the, in, in our settings. So it was a long period coming from, uh, starting from uh, developing experiments to actually being able to analyze time series because now we had data and then start modeling this data. So all, all this knowledge that uh, uh, was uh, built during the 10 to 15 years end up in the development of a, a healthy community of modelers in Brazil. So I would say that uh, Brazil has a, a very active uh, community of uh, uh, experts in dengue fever and other aedes borne diseases. Okay, so the, the, the community was very healthy, but not the, not, not the, the, the public health. So we still have a lot of, of cases going on. So in the uh, about 2015, we had this huge epidemics of uh, the arrival of dengue 4, and it was a very critical situation in Brazil about 2014. And um, not only in Brazil, but uh, we saw like chikungunya spreading. Chikungunya was already uh, emerging in Central America. We had like big outbreaks in other parts of the world and the attention was increasing for the, the risk of uh, these diseases, not only for the tropical uh, regions, but for the other regions as well. So, and especially, particularly in Brazil, in Rio, we had these uh, problems with these big games and big uh, events that was taking place. And of course, in these events, uh, they are very uh, critical scenarios when we think about uh, diseases and transmission of diseases. So uh, this led us to InfoDengue then. <laughs> so so the, all this uh, knowledge that, that was uh, built during the, the last years, the previous years, and uh, the necessity of uh, developing uh, a tool for uh, public health led us to, this, to accept this challenge. Because one thing is to develop models in a research and academic situation, and the other thing is try to solve a problem, to keep track of a problem in real time. So we posed this, this, this uh, challenge of uh, doing this uh, analysis of dengue situation in real time and uh, providing guidelines uh, in real time for all the partners that we had. So uh, we joined with the surveillance teams and we developed this tool that's basically an early warning system. It's based on the models and the experience that we had and also the experience of the field workers that work with the, the real situation. Okay, so it's a system that uh, uses uh, 
different types of data. They, we use all the data that we can get that's easy to get and, and readily available, like the notification of dengue cases. We use the meteorological data from the stations, the meteorological stations, like temperature and humidity. And we also use uh, tweets. Basically, the idea of using uh, online uh, data, like tweets, is that uh, people, they tend to talk about disease before they go to the doctor. Or sometimes they talk about their symptoms without even going to the doctor. So it's a really sensitive indicator of the, the occurrence of something that can be dengue. So we've been studying this and this, this type of information can actually improve the, the signal uh, of, uh, that we get from other sources of data as the reported cases and all. And um, the other feature that we want, we wanted from this system that uh, besides being like very fast, uh, that uh, this system should be actionable. I mean, it should be something that people could absorb and read the information as soon as possible and then use it in an in a, a easy way in order to take action. Okay. So this was a, a, our challenge. And uh, when, we start looking at the problem from this perspective of someone that's tracking the disease in real time. We, the first challenge that we faced was that uh, the notification data, that means the reported cases, okay, uh, that uh, the cases that are reported to the surveillance uh, system, oops, sorry, it's always late, always takes some time for the cases a person to get infected and the information be available. So this can take like two, three weeks, sometimes more. And what happens is that uh, uh, when the, the, the typical surveillance system, like uh, the standard surveillance team, they look at the data, they always looking at the past. Okay, so this is an example. This is taken from a, a report from the Ministry of Health in Brazil, but it's similar in other places of the world. Where we have here in red, the, the, the thick line is like the number of cases uh, that we know for certain. And then this, this the dashed line represents the more recent data that is still incomplete because not all cases were like uh, reported yet. So this means that most of the time they are uh, discussing the, the risk of the, the disease, but looking at data from the past. And this is, was really a problem if you want to be, um, you need to want to do a real uh, uh, time analysis, we need to fix that. So we, uh, because of this, we develop uh, uh, new methods, uh, uh, Bayesian modeling specific to deal with this problem. Basically, uh, if, uh, if you want, want, anyone wants detail about that, I can discuss this later. But basically, we have this um, matrix where we, uh, we can have organized the, the data that we know and the set of data that we don't know yet. And this, by using uh, Bayesian uh, inference, we estimate the, the, this number of, of cases that should be reported but had not been yet. So this kind of a correction of the time series that allows us to uh, have a, an estimation of the current number of cases, uh, even if uh, we don't have all the whole information yet. And that makes the big difference because sometimes the time series suggests that the, the disease is like going down, but it's actually going up. And uh, without this uh, correction, we cannot say that. So that's uh, one thing that uh, we implemented for InfoDengue and but also has been applied to other diseases. It was very important for the COVID surveillance as well, this tool. And uh, the tweets the, that I said, the online data can also be used as a covariate in this system and actually help the, to improve the accuracy of these estimates. So, the second challenge that we had was like, okay, we want to be actionable. So we want to uh, 
uh, end up with something that can be easily translated into action. And uh, when we look at the, the way that uh, the surveillance teams think, they think about uh, uh, situations. They don't think, they don't really want to so focus. They are not so focused on the number of cases, but more in the situation. So the questions are, are we in the dengue season? Have we, uh, are we, uh, do we have sustained transmission now? Or what are the conditions? Uh, do we expect to have a, like a, a, an epidemic or is it gonna be a, like a, a, a seasonal variation that's gonna be within the, the expectations? So they have like qualitative answers. So we thought, okay, uh, let's try to provide these qualitative answers for them, okay? And try, and so, uh, and so we developed this approach where we look at transmission, we look at, uh, okay, so uh, we want to see what are the, the conditions for transmission in this, uh, in this city and try to identify um, this as soon as possible in order to provide alerts. Uh, so if we want to, to do that, we need to, we had, we need to develop some methods too. So uh, transmission, when we think about transmission of dengue is uh, uh, we need to take into, into consideration the mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes, they have a cycle and the cycle, the transmission uh, cycle of the dengue involving mosquitoes is also dependent on temperature. So that's how climate enters in the story. So we have this, uh, um, we have developed this uh, estimator of uh, dengue transmission that takes into consideration uh, temperature in the calculation. So this uh, um, takes the, uh, the form of a reproductive number that uh, is temperature dependent. So here is, uh, we show a time series of dengue in Rio de Janeiro to give an, an illustration. So these are like 10 years of data. You see in red, we have the weeks with uh, transmission, sustained transmission. That means that the number of cases are increasing. So the mosquitoes are being able to uh, transmit enough for the cases to increase in red. And in blue is the period where the transmission is decreasing. So the reproductive number is less than one and, and there is not enough uh, mosquitoes for transmission to take place. And uh, here in this box, we see, it's hard to see, but this is temperature in the y-axis, okay? And here uh, in red, we have the weeks with uh, transmission and the, in blue, the weeks without transmission. So it's clear that trans, um, sustained transmission of this disease in this uh, city is really dependent on temperature. You need at least a temperature above 20 to 20, uh, 21 degrees in order to have conditions for transmission. So this is just an illustration, but it gives an idea that how important uh, climate is for um, this disease and how important it, and how it could be used as a, a, a early warning for the transmission of this disease. So with all these uh, pieces of analysis, we built a pipeline of uh, analysis where we get all every week, we have a, a, a stream of tweet data, a stream of reported cases and a stream of uh, temperature and humidity data. With the, these cases and the tweets, we calculate this now cast, that's the adjustment of the number of cases. And then we calculate these uh, indicators with the temperature. We identify the climate receptivity of the, for <clears throat> the conditions are favorable for transmission. And then we identify uh, periods with sustained transmission and periods when the transmission or the, the, the incidence is above a certain threshold. And this gives us this qualitative uh, analysis that is translated into four colors that provide this uh, um, color code for this alert system. So this is an, uh, a case, for example, in Rio, 
where we have like a period with uh, that's uh, colored green that the con uh, the temperature is below that threshold and the uh, um, the number of cases is below a certain threshold and the conditions are okay and then yellow when the conditions go above uh, are uh, the, the climate conditions are favorable for transmission in orange when the 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 sustained transmission is detected and it, it, in this case we don't have this uh, high transmission because it went down so you can see here the type of output that we can show to the to the uh, teams to the surveillance teams and this is something that they can uh, process easily so here the dotted line also is the the now casting case okay, showing the the number of predicted cases suggesting that it's going up instead of staying going down as the reported case show. So we did that for Rio, and then uh, uh, during the years, we expand that for the whole country. So nowadays we have this uh, system running for the 5,000 municipalities of Brazil. And uh, the, we keep uh, doing this uh, weekly. We provide e weekly reports for the uh, for different levels, municipal and state and federal level. And we also uh, develop uh, an app because uh, we found out that uh, sometimes people don't really have access to computers. They don't use computers like in a daily way. So sometimes easier to use uh, an app. And uh, so they can get a rep, uh, a rep uh, knowledge about the situation in their, in their city. And then they can then access the, the web page for more details. We also send for everybody, the, the, all the, the, the teams, a PDF with the reports, the, the more detailed reports. And you also have the site where people can uh, do the consultations no more freely way. So it has been very uh, um, successful in this way because, uh, because uh, in the way that we are trying to connect with people. Uh, so we are learning with them and trying to improve the ways we, we connect with them. Uh, we learned also that uh, it's not enough to uh, provide this um, technical reports, we need to go further. And in order to, for, people, for the community to pay attention to what we provide in terms of information, we need to engage them in different ways. So since like 2019, we started investing in communication, different platforms. So in Brazil, uh, Instagram and Facebook are popular uh, media. So we invested a lot in um, engaging in producing information for this, like uh, education, like in terms of uh, protection uh, for dengue and also giving information and also, uh, yeah, trying to, to create a community uh, interested in this topic. Uh, we also, uh, engage with other groups that are different uh, uh, projects on dengue in Brazil. This one is a very interesting one where they uh, have this uh, community, these kids that they are the heroes against dengue. So they are <laughs> fighting dengue with knowledge. So they were invited to talk to the scientists and we are the scientists. So they send us questions and we had to answer very difficult questions. Uh, that they, they had. So it was a very interesting project. So this is one example of this different uh, engagement uh, uh, projects that we did. And also, uh, we learned that uh, some, sometimes the indicators that we produce seem simple to one, to one for ourselves, but it's not for others. So many uh, professionals, health professionals had still many questions about how to use this infodengue, what are these indicators, what, what is now casting, What's, uh, uh, why climate is important for uh, monitoring diseases. So we, uh, we thought necessary to 
to come up to develop us uh, educational material. So uh, we launched this uh, mock book and the uh, platform uh, course in last year in October. So it has like four months. And uh, it's really, it uh, has been like a very interesting to see how the people, uh, all the, the health professionals from around the country are interested and they really uh, enrolled in this, uh, in this course. And uh, in this course, it's interesting that they, we, uh, there is this uh, community of practice, like a forum where people can continue, af even after the, they finish the course, they can continue uh, you know, uh, discussing their, uh, the, the issues in their, in their municipalities, in their cities, regarding dengue surveillance and dengue action. So uh, it was a, a very interesting uh, experience for us. Challenging too, because it's difficult to keep track of all this, but still but very challenging and interesting. And uh, yeah, and of course, uh, as uh, this, uh, we become more uh, engaged in all these platforms and all this uh, media, we, uh, we start being able to, uh, to, to reach a large audience and actually in, uh, being um, heard for, in different settings. So it has been an interesting experience as a researcher that uh, we start as like a modelers and a very like a academic environment. And now we are in this very different uh, place. So, and so the future now, so, um, so far this, um, this tool that uh, was developed, it was a tool for uh, real-time assessment of risk, of risk. And uh, now we need, we want uh, a new challenge. So we are looking ahead trying to, uh, uh, seeking to develop uh, models to, uh, to forecast, like to obtain short-term and medium-term and long-term forecasts for, uh, for dengue and uh, other vector-borne diseases in, in Brazil. And um, so here, uh, this uh, in part explains why I'm here at the PSC and the group of, uh, led by Rachel. And so here, for example, is a couple of papers by Rachel uh, that uh, shows how dengue is uh, spreading to the south of the country. So it's going to higher latitudes. And so we are really facing a moment of uh, change. And uh, we know that's going on in the whole uh, world, but uh, in Brazil too, and also in other parts of South America. So we need to, uh, it's not sufficient just to track the current situation. We need to look ahead and, and try to plan for the future. And climate is a key uh, aspect of this uh, process, of this problem. So, so um, here you know, you know, with, uh, at the BSC with uh, Rachel, we are seeking um, ways to improve this, uh, this capacity of uh, long-term forecasts for dengue and arbovirus diseases in, in Brazil and other, um, other countries in South America. And, uh, and info dengue, and this, this tool will be like, uh, like in between this, uh, this academic part and the community, so we could act as a stakeholder connecting this uh, new advances and analysis to the community in a way that we could uh, apply the results that we obtain here. Okay. So this is uh, what I had to say, and I'm looking forward to all these projects. <laughs> I want to thank all these collaborators from Fiocruz, FGP, from uh, different universities, and uh, thank you. <laughs> and, Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Claudia. <laughs> and, and of course, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, and we're really happy to have you here at the BSC and excited to start the Harmonize project with you.
Um, so we welcome any questions uh, from uh, the remote participants and also if anyone in the room uh, would like to ask a question, uh, feel free. <laughs> And when we didn't lock him of three and four, the, the cases went up. Do you know if it's because it, it's more transmitted because of the virus or because the condition uh, was favorable to most people? Um, I repeat, should yes. So, so the question is, um, given that uh, dengue has four different serotypes, um, different serotypes have been introduced at different times, are the outbreaks due to those serotypes or due to environmental conditions? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, that is uh, an explanation that's um, related to the multiple infections with multiple viruses and serotypes because uh, uh, increasing the number of uh, serotypes or infections increase our uh, antibody uh, immune response, and that can increase, exacerbate the symptoms. So we get more symptomatic cases. So that causes an increasing number of cases and also a an increase in, in severe cases. But at the same time, during this period, that, that was like a, a large um, change in urbanization and the different parts of the country start to become more urban. So this can explain in part. And also there are some uh, states in the, in towards the South, like Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte that didn't have uh, cases uh, dengue before. And now they had like huge outbreaks because these are huge cities and they didn't have the, the, the cases uh, the epidemics in, in Belo Horizonte and uh, Sao Paulo start like uh, four or five years ago, the first epidemics there. So it's like a mixture of uh, a new, vi new viruses and also climate and probably also urbanization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Nube. Yes, thank you very much, Claudia. Really interested talk. Um, I would like to ask something because in one of your um, first uh, slide, you saw uh, three different maps from South America with the regions in which um, the mosquitoes uh, were. And uh, you see that there were, there were like in the map of in between the mosquitoes disappear and then appear again in 2012. So I'm wondering if you have any clue of why this uh, behavior. Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's an uh, interesting story uh, because uh, Aedes aegypti, this mosquito is a uh, the origin is uh, uh, in Africa. It went to, Amer to the Americas with the slaves and all this uh, colonization period. And it spread all over the, uh, the Americas. It was the uh, main uh, vector of yellow fever and yellow fever in urban areas. And yellow fever was like a, a very severe uh, disease that uh, was uh, like uh, causing big epidemics and killing uh, like a large proportion of the population. Sometimes a ship would come from Europe to Brazil and half of the ship uh, this, uh, died from this, this yellow fever. It was a horrible thing. So in the beginning of the 20th century, there was this big effort uh, financed by the United States to control infodengue, oh, in control, sorry, control uh, these mosquitoes in, in, whole, in the whole Americas. So, so with using insecticides. So there was this big effort. It was amazing. And actually uh, eliminated mosquitoes from most of the countries, but uh, some focus remained. So after uh, the mosquitoes uh, um, uh, when this action stopped, they didn't continue with this, the, the mosquitoes came again and reinvaded the, 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 the areas. So it took a while. So it took about like uh, 20 years uh, 
for the between the elimination and the reinvasion again. But the, that but that's, that's okay. Thank happened. you very much. Very interesting. So then maybe um, maybe it's not that related with climate condition, for instance, but it's more related with that. At that point, there were a lot of amount of money resources just focusing on eliminating the mosquitoes. And then maybe this was uh, was not continuing in the time, let's say. Yes, exactly. And the and the, also these mosquitoes uh, evolved resistance to the insecticide, so that's one ah, reason yeah. why we couldn't continue with this the same approach. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks very much, um, Yes, hello. Thanks for the talk. It was it was quite interesting. It's not my field, but I was wondering. I had a question about about the, the meteorological data that that you use. And I was wondering if 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 you include uh, I don't know some some kind of cumulated precipitations and and information about the the, the, the land the, I mean the soil to to because I guess the mosquitoes need uh, places with water to reproduce so I was I was wondering which type of uh, information you use for for taking this into account. Mm -hmm. uh, good, uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, it's very, uh, first of all, these mosquitoes, they are, they breed inside the houses, they breed in like a, in containers that are made for by us, like a small, like vessels, I think that we build. So they are not really uh, like, uh, they don't like pretty much like uh, holes or trees or anything. They are very urban mosquitoes. Uh, so in certain way, the, the precipitation is, is not so a strong predictor because um, in these many places, people have to store water for their use, or uh, in these many places, uh, we have like, yeah, uh, uh, we, we um, store water in a way that mosquitoes can use it for breeding. So no, it's not so sensitive to precipitation in this sense. Uh, of course, that uh, the precipitation can exacerbate the number of mosquitoes in, in some places, uh, but it's very difficult to, to, to find this relationship between precipitation and mosquito abundance. It, it's not a very direct relationship because there is this delay and all, the, it's not, it's a non-linear relationship and it's, yeah, it's a challenge. So for, for us, uh, humidity and the temperature is a more direct are more direct uh, have more direct effects because uh, temperature and humidity uh, limits the conditions of the mosquito flying and producing and so it's more linked to the biology of the mosquito so and the virus within the mosquitoes so it's a more direct relationship but still uh, precipitation can be uh, it's a good uh, variable to look at. Any other questions? Yeah, Flavia. Um, do you think that Infodengi could be used to help uh, like other countries could be adapted? Like for instance, the countries neighboring Brazil, has there been any initiative to look at the how things across the border with Brazil are going in based on? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's a very important to consider the neighbor countries because, uh, yeah, uh, of course, the mosquitoes and the diseases, they, they cross the borders. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it can be done since we are using source of data that are similar. They could be uh, found in these other countries, but so it's possible, but uh, the main challenge is really, uh, yeah, to define the, 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 the conditions for the, to have contact with the people and really create the, the political conditions and the conditions for this uh, to be done. But uh, yes, the, the answer, yes, since, uh, is, since uh, we can easily develop the same uh, indicators based on this, the variables that people, the, the countries tend to collect in a regular way. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. Um, I had a question, Claudia. I was wondering, um, speaking with your stakeholders and users of the system, do you have a feeling for the sorts of timescales they're interested in in terms of lead times? Like, so you had meant you have a now now casting system, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> at, at the BSC would like to have a go at trying to incorporate climate forecasts at different timescales from subseasonal to seasonal, and even consider projections. Um, so just having, uh, just wondering if you have a feeling for what is their priority and do they appreciate the kind of uncertainties that will be introduced into the predictions if we extend the lead time? Um, that's an important question. Uh, I would say that uh, in general, they are interested in knowing, for example, what's going to happen the next uh, summer. So it's really important for um, to organize the the resources and all to allocate resources to have some information about this, what's going to have happen in, in that uh, next season, where it's going to start and all this. Uh, because since uh, uh, Brazil is such a big country, the, the season's not the same, uh, it doesn't start the same moment in all places. So it's really important to have this idea. And uh, nowadays, they tend to rely on the indicators that are not so like sensitive they look at for example the number of mosquitoes in the beginning of the season and from this information they see okay so if there's there are lots of mosquitoes now probably we're gonna have many cases but if we could improve this and have really uh, a more uh, complex model with more information aggregate more data we could help and could it be very useful to identify areas of the country with high risk uh, with like uh, uh, some months ahead. Yeah, definitely. Longer than that, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I never tried to discuss longer um, uh, periods, periods, but uh, yeah, that could, I don't know. <laughs> So they're most interested, so the start of the season around October, and, and then they're most interested having, say, a few months ahead of that time to prepare and allocate resources. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I was curious because, well, Brazil is highly heterogeneous, like the different municipalities, they you have places that are like Rio, that are the urban structure of the city is more or less more it's it's already let's say established so you can mm -hmm. learn by climate and 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 the trees they are very good uh, predictors for the, the modeling but also there are some cities where you are starting to have work for the urbanization is starting so you have these um changes in the in the in the actual structure of the city and uh, I don't know if this impacts like the uh, uh, model accuracy in these different regions or if there is a way of correcting for this I would think that yeah that's that's a very uh, good question it's a big challenge because uh yeah uh, in general we we when we are doing like a, a early warning system or doing an outcast we are using information from the past to to say something about the current situation but uh, when the, the we have all these changes taking place all this so we it's really a challenge to identify places that's not yet for example don't have a a, a, a lot of activity and suddenly starts to have so what we uh we've been doing it's like uh, we can identify very early this beginning of uh, cases in areas that people are not looking at so for example most of the time the traditional surveillance is focused in the areas where the case is already we already have a lot of activity so they're paying attention to that place they're not paying attention to places where there's no activity so when we have the system like this, where we combine all these sources of information, we can actually have like a more uh, broad view of, the, of the, the disease of the country. So we can pinpoint like, okay, there's something th going on in this area that's not common, something's going on. So we can 
provide this kind of warning. It's not, it's not like a, I'm not predicting something that's going to happen because it's like a, a, an outcasting thing. So we are tracking the situation now, but I can, we can identify uh, situations that are not common, uncommon, that should uh, be uh, analyzed carefully by the uh, few team, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a question here in the chat from Nube uh, regarding meteorological data that you are using. Uh, is there a defined range of temperature values in which the mosquito can develop? Do you know if the mosquitoes are affected by heat waves, for instance? Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, the mosquito, this uh, mosquito that transmits dengue, actually there are two species, Aedes aegypti and the Albo pictus. But in Brazil, it's mostly Egypti, this, the main uh, uh, vector involved. And uh, they, uh, uh, the minimum temperature for them to really be active <laughs> is about like 17, 18 degrees, like 16 degrees that would be like the minimum. But they can um, live for months. In, in, in colder climates because they can the, the eggs can uh, become like a, um, they can stay uh, alive for like six months uh, even in a cold climate so if you have like a window of like three months uh, with uh, temperatures above 17 or 16 degrees is sufficient for the for them to to grow and the, and the disease and the virus to spread. And the other question? Um, yeah, and I guess there's the upper limit as well. Okay. Uh, the upper limit, there is an upper limit. I mean, the, the mosquitoes, if you say mosquitoes are exposed to more than 35 degrees, it's really going to have an impact. But uh, uh, they can hide. I mean, so the, there's all these adaptations from the mosquitoes to hide in places. So they they are they are mostly found indoors. So it's like under the table, like hidden somewhere. So they they can um, yeah protect themselves from these high uh, temperatures. And they adapt to climate change. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then the other question was about, well, heat waves, which I guess is related. Yeah, they're adapting. Mm -hmm, mostly. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so we just have uh, one minute left. Uh, if there's any other questions from the audience, so we could take one more. Um, okay, that's thanks from Nube. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring the seminar to a close. And um, thank you, Claudia. That was really fascinating. Um, thank you. We really appreciate you being here. And have a lovely day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>